start recording and let me make sure everything is as it should be. Which I think it is. Whenever you're ready. Um, great. Welcome back, everybody. This is the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. Uh, you're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and this is, um, pro I guess, part 13 of this sutra that we've been looking at now for several months. Um, the Akshayamati Sutra, otherwise known as the Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra. Uh, that's this guy, the Bodhisattva, whose name means inexhaustible intellect or inexhaustible mind, inexhaustible wisdom, something to that effect. Um, and we had just concluded this very long in-depth excursion into these 10 practices of a bodhisattva. That's what the bodhisattva Akshayamati asked the Buddha. He basically asked, what's the, bo what's the bodhisattva practice? What's the being a bodhisattva all about? Um, and ultimately, actually, what he's really asking about is developing the, a mind of supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment, otherwise known as the enlightenment of a, of a Buddha. And so it's a pretty big question. It's a very big question to ask the Buddha, which is like, well, not, not just, you know, uh, Buddha... Uh, I'm suffering. How do I alleviate my suffering? And then the Buddha dispenses the knowledge. This is a little more than just me and my suffering in that way. This is this bigger question of total enlightenment, uh, total nirvana. And what we learned was that there are these 10 paramitas that are these practices or observances. Um, it's actually a little tricky what the word paramita means, but that's what we're going to discuss tonight is the idea of a paramita in general. Um, so whether they're in an observance or a practice or a virtue, the idea is, is that the Buddha has said that in order to develop a supremely enlightened mind, one cultivates these 10 things giving, generosity, discipline, sometimes called moral discipline, um, kashanti, patience, drive or determination, virya, uh, meditation, dhyana, uh, intuitive wisdom or transcendent wisdom, otherwise known as pranya, that's number six, and then also skillfulness or a skill and means, right? And also <clears throat> power, interesting one, power, devotion. And then finally, last week, we discussed knowledge. And this isn't just like uh, learning things like book smart knowledge. This is sort of a, a, a grander idea of knowledge that we talked about last time. And those are the practices of the Bodhisattva. And those really shouldn't seem strange to anyone, right? Because of course, as I like to do when I'm uh, teaching the Dharma in this way, it's sort of like, we, these, are the, these are the virtues. These are the practices of a Bodhisattva, of a seeker of enlightenment. Otherwise, one's being not so generous. <laughs> That's sort of a maybe the non-bodhisattva practice, the non-bodhisattva way of doing things is being a little stingy, being a little not generous. How about a little moral laxity, right? Oh, I was going to stop telling lies, but I'll get to that tomorrow, right? So moral laxity. Uh, how about a little impatience? Bodhisattvas are over there being all patient, right? So to not be a bodhisattva is to be an impatient, ungenerous, morally lax, undriven, no drive, lazy, right? Uh, no meditation, just really quick to respond, you know, no contemplation practice whatsoever. Uh, pranya, intuitive knowledge, nah, I'm just believing whatever anybody tells me, right? <laughs> so I'm going to be really sort of ignorant, um, skillfulness, 
nah, no tact. We're talking blunt, in your face, kind of an activity, you know, kind of a person, right? Power, we're talking about the disempowered. We're talking about those, we're talking about feeling like, ah, oh, I just can't, I couldn't do it. Uh, not me, right? Devotion, kind of a surrendering in a way. Don't worry, I got this. That's, that's it. Don't worry, I got it. I don't need any help. I can do this all by myself, right? And then finally, ignorance, and rather than knowledge, just utter ignorance. So I'm pretty familiar with life uh, in the more stingy, morally lax way. And now as part of the Bodhisattva practice, I'm going to start working on my generosity, moral discipline, and so on. So that's the idea there. Again, I don't even think we need to like call them paramitas, right? We don't even really like to think about it. We just kind of think about these ideas of what does it mean to be generous? What does it mean to be withholding and, and hoarding and stingy in that way? Pretty simple, really. And then what the practice is about is recognizing how we don't always observe these things. So that's the idea. And what was really great, what's been really great about the last 10, 11, 12 weeks is that if you were a little confused about what exactly is the bodhisattva practice of giving, or what exactly is the bodhisattva's practice of shila, moral discipline, what exactly are these? Well, this sutra is perfect because the Buddha listed 10 dharmas, 10 practices or observances that the bodhisattva considers foremost in the practice of each of these 10. And so indeed, we, we discussed a hundred different dharmas, a hundred different practices, 10 for each of the paramitas. And that pretty much brings us to where we are now. And, you know, I was thinking about jumping to the next sort of um, major section of this sutra. And again, I think I mentioned this last week, we've only really started this sutra, even though it's, uh, we're in, we're several weeks into this. Um, and so I had considered jumping to the next section, which is kind of almost why I chose this sutra was for the next section. We got a little waylaid in paramitas, which I'm always willing to get waylaid in paramitas. So I was of course then eager to jump to the section that I wanted to share with you, but I would have actually been doing the sutra uh, a disservice, you know, because this sutra has a, it has a structure, it has a flow, it has movements. It's, uh, we've noticed, or I think you may have noticed, it's not as narrative. It doesn't have quite the narrative that some of our other sutras have, where there's a little more of a story and, a little more maybe dialogue and back and forth. This is sort of the, these lists. And of course, Buddhism is famous for its lists, lists upon lists, lists within lists, right? So this sutra is very Buddhist in that way, but it's like really Buddhist where it's a, lot, a bunch of these lists, right? And Actually, for the first thing I want to say about these lists, the list of 10 and the 10 tens, and, and indeed even the section that we're moving towards is another list of 10. I wanted to just talk about this real quick, this the sutra that we're talking about, you know, it's a really, um, it's an interesting sutra because it is a, a summary. Uh, and even though it seems a little dense, this is really only like, you know, what, five, six, seven pages long. As far as sutras go, that's pretty short. And so it's a, it's a condensed, short, very, very uh, abbreviated version of the whole Bodhisattva practice that sometimes takes hundreds upon hundreds of pages to explain. And this has been like reduced down to just these lists. And so there's something going on here with this sutra. Um, you know, so, so we, this is the Dharma doors, right? And the idea is, is that a sutra is a, um, 
is like a doorway or a gateway to knowledge, to understanding, to liberation. So in Buddhism, they talk about sutras as Dharma doors. And that's why I call this Sunday night um, class, the Dharma doors. Well, if, if you've ever seen the, the second Matrix movie where Neo's in those long hallways, just full of doors, and like each door leads to a new world and it's just doors upon doors upon doors. And, and in that second movie, Neo, he's kind of like behind the scenes of the matrix when he's in those hallways. <laughs> We're kind of in those hallways, the, the Dharma door hallways, <laughs> because the idea is that this sutra is like the, it's like the schematic or the, the real skeleton of the bodhisattva practice. And it's almost like from this sutra, you, you could pick any one of these little doors, open up and jump through and you're in a whole new uh, world in that way. And so it's kind of a magical sutra for being sort of the infrastructure of the bodhisattva practice, that sort of behind the scenes, right? So I just want you to know that it, it this sutra has that feeling to it that it's sort of like this, like um, a schematic or some one of those technical maps that you're looking at. And again, not a narrative and not a story. So I just wanted to say that about the structure of it. Um, and so what's about to happen is, is that we're going to take a moment to, to breathe. <laughs> and we're gonna take a moment actually to digest those, hundred dharmas I mentioned, which are the 10 paramitas and their 10 successive practices. So uh, the sutra takes a break. It takes a moment. And I, and that's where I said, you know what? I got to take a moment too. I can't jump to the next section yet. We need to sort of uh, talk in general about how all of these paramitas are interconnected in a way. And that's what this next section is about. Um, I wanted to say one more thing before we get into the, the, the text. I wanted to say one more thing about the style of, of this. Uh, it's the style of the sutra, but it's the style of all of this. There's, I've, and a lot of people have asked me to speak more about this, but I don't, it's something I'm working on in my head. So I, I kind of just spit out things every now and then about it. But you know, you, you, you may know that these sutras are originally in verse. They're in a poetic form. Uh, they have uh, lines of a particular meter that are number of certain number of syllables long. And so there is a cadence to sutras in their original Sanskrit. And actually even that cadence, the Chinese try to preserve a certain sense of that cadence. Um, it's not, of course, not in the same number of syllables. Obviously, it's an entirely different phonetic, so it's not uh, in any way ca capturing the actual poetics. But what I mean is, is that there's a certain way in which these sutras read, and there's something in our modern world, a certain genre of art that I find very similar to Buddhist poetics. And that genre is basically like rap music. <laughs> and it's for a number of reasons. Um, yes, because there's this kind of poetic cadence to these. So sutras are kind of like poetry. And of course, uh, rap, rap music and rap lyrics are a kind of poetics. But I'm thinking more about a certain style that, and I don't know if you're, if any of you kind of listen to rap and hip hop music in that way, but you probably know what I might be referring to even if you don't, which is that, you know, rap as a form of poetry is very interesting because it's, it's very, you know, obviously very playful, linguistically speaking, but it's big on these kind of metaphors. And so if you think of a certain, um, and I've been trying to, this is where I, I, it's tricky for me to say this because it's like, there are the ideas I have about this, but, if you, you could imagine a certain lyricist, a certain uh, a poetic rap lyricist who could then within a certain framework, maybe, um, you know, picking up on a, on a certain language thing, 
like uh, the like indomitable. Uh, you know, I'm indomitable, uh, unstoppable. In, you know, and starting to have a string of words that are all about this in or un, undefeatable, indomitable, un this, un that. And you could get locked into, and a lot of good rap is kind of hypnotic that way, where you're, you, you have a metaphor and you have even a kind of a linguistic trope, which is like a prefix, like un, undefeated, unbelie I'm unbelievable, undefeated, un this, un that. And it would turn into a kind of flow Buddhist sutras are kind of like that. <laughs> they are kind of hyperbolic, I think is a good way to put it. And, but they also are very linguistic where they're, they're playing with language and then building upon metaphors and the metaphors keep getting built upon. And so there's a lot of parallels with the playfulness of, um, you know, probably what people would call conscious rap in that way where the, where the lyricist is a little more cognizant of that type of wordplay. But I think there's a lot of parallels. And so I say all that, A, because if you're into rap or hip hop, I say that to entice you, you know, into reading sutras, of course. But also it's just sort of to, um, well, basically that's a way to explain what's about to happen. <laughs> and so it was already kind of a mouthful for the Buddha to tell Bodhisattva Akshayamati Oh yeah, there's these 10 practices and then within each of those, there's 10. And so at this point, again, we've covered a hundred dharmas and, and our, our, our minds are exhausted, right? We, we don't have inexhaustible minds and so we're a little exhausted. But the idea is, is that after this, um, you know, we've spent 11, 10 weeks reading this. So it's been kind of a snail's pace. But originally you would read all of this sort of in one sitting in a way. And so just when you thought <laughs> the, the avalanche of Dharma was over, <laughs> that's when the Buddha says, and now virtuous one, um, well, let me get on the right page. <laughs> and now virtuous one, what, and now what is the meaning of paramita. <laughs> That's actually what rhetorically the Buddha says. And what is and what does paramita mean? So even though we've just gone through these 10 paramitas, we're now going to take this moment to just dwell on the concept of paramita. And um I've been thinking about how to do this. Part of me just wants to read all of this to you at once, right? This idea, so let me just do that. And I think I will, um, I'm, I'm gonna read from the book. I do have my translation, but it's not as fluid as this yet. So let me just read these. So let me read to you how this sounds, right? So after all of that, Virtuous one, when bodhisattva mahasattvas practice the 10 paramitas, they regard those 10 things in each category as foremost. And furthermore, virtuous one, what are or what is the meaning of paramita? Well, it means to recognize clearly the practices that surpass those of followers and solitary sages to recognize clearly the vast perfect wisdom of all Tathagatas, to be detached from both the conditioned and unconditioned dharmas, to understand the undesirability of samsara as it really is, to enlighten those who are not yet enlightened, to acquire the inexhaustible dharma treasury of the Tathagata, to obtain unhindered liberation, to save sentient beings by giving, to fulfill all original vows by discipline, to obtain all majestic adornments through patience, to fathom the ultimate depth of all the Buddha's teachings by vigor, to generate the four immeasurables by dhyana meditation, to eradicate all afflictions by pranya wisdom, to accumulate all the Buddha's teachings by great upaya, to fulfill the Buddha's dharma by devotion, to awaken sentient beings pure faith by power, 
to obtain the all-knowing wisdom of the Tathagata by jnana, knowledge, to acquire the realization of the non-arising of all dharmas, to attain the state of non-regression, to purify a Buddha land, to bring sentient beings to maturity, to consummate at the sight of enlightenment the wisdom of all Tathagatas, to vanquish all Mara demons, to gain command of the four bases of supernatural powers, to abide neither in samsara nor in nirvana, to transcend all of the merit of followers and solitary sages and bodhisattvas, to overcome all heterodox doctrines, to achieve the 10 powers, the four fearlessnesses, and the 18 unique qualities of a Buddha, to realize supreme enlightenment, and to turn the 12 kinds of Dharma wheels. All these are the meaning of paramita. <laughs> okay, so that was just to sort of show you how it, it flowed. If you were counting, there are 30 more dharmas there. But I do think that there's a way in which this sutra doesn't really want you to count anymore. It's like this sort of like cascade of, of ideas at that point. And the, that cascade of ideas that just uh, shower down upon you are all these ways of understanding paramita. And so let's start, let's start with a quick discussion of paramita. So the word paramita actually means sort of to cross over. It's kind of has a sense of um, um, like, you know, in English, we have a word trans like transatlantic or a trans-Pacific flight, transatlantic flight. And by transatlantic, it means it goes over the Atlantic. And that word like comes like maybe from transom, like if you know what a transom is, a transom window, and that's like a, a passage through. So that word in English, like a trans or a transom, that's actually kind of not etymologically, but Conceptually, it's related to this idea of paramita. And in particular, what the word paramita has always referred to, it referred to was something, you know, maybe it's a practice or an observance. It's why I'm always vacillating between those uh, definitions. But a paramita is something that can deliver one out of samsara and to nirvana. Or actually because this particular list gets complicated in terms of nirvana and samsara, let's say out of ignorance to enlightenment, out of ignorance to liberation, out of ignorance to Buddhahood in that way. So it's this idea of something or again, an observance or a practice that can draw one out of ignorance or out of suffering to liberation, non-suffering or something like that. And so really quickly, if you just kind of think of the 10 paramitas, it's like, oh, generosity is a practice that can deliver me out of ignorance and suffering. Got it. And, and again, just flip it. And it's like, oh, so hoarding and stinginess is keeping me in ignorance and suffering. Got it. So they just, you know, just look at it that way. So a paramita is this, this, um, I actually um, sometimes like to translate paramita as a deliverance, deliverance by wisdom, deliverance by generosity. The problem is deliverance has certain Christian connotations that I kind of usually want to avoid. So, but there's an interesting you know, relationship there, this idea of delivering or crossing over. Sometimes people even uh, would uh, kind of think of it or conceptualize it of as ferrying over, right? So kind of a ferry in that way. And what, what I want you to know is, and this is why I kind of spoke quickly about that idea of uh, uh, the Buddha, the rap god, right? Because the idea is, is that this 
these 30, if you actually start to look at them linguistically, they are all playing with a certain concept of crossing over or ferrying over in a way. So it's actually poetically very beautiful what they're about, what they do here in terms of, oh, what does paramita mean, right? Um, so the first one, for example, was to, what does paramita mean? Oh, it means to completely realize and surpass the teachings of Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas. And of course, Shravakas, so-called voice hearers, that's sort of, um, uh, it's a reference to a certain monastic path that is considered, um, well, not as great as the Bodhisattva path in that way. It's considered a little self-serving in a certain sense. And mainly the idea or the problem from the Mahayana Bodhisattva point of view is that a voice hearer, a shravaka, they call them followers. They, they listen to what the Buddha tells them to do and they do it. They're good followers. But Buddhism has always sort of been about this idea of self-realization and not and that's a funny term, self-realization, because we don't mean realizing the self, we mean realization by oneself. That it, you, we all do this actually by our self in a way. But, you know, Bodhisattva patrol, I can hear the Bodhisattva patrol. You're ringing the alarms like, oh, by the self, but I thought Bodhisattvas weren't supposed to have a self, right? No, 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 no I know. But the ideas we're talking about this sort of idea of following a leader, following uh, rules, following, and in a certain sense, you know, almost blindly following in that way, where it's like, oh, Buddha said, sit this way, I sit this way. Buddha said, do that, I do that. And there's a way from the Bodhisattva point of view that that type of blind following, it's not that it's um, bad, especially if you're doing dharma it's great right but it's not as good as a more self-realized enlightenment in that way so one that's not like step a step b step c i'm enlightened but actually realizing it for oneself and so paramita in this sense means to surpass the practices of those who follow. And also these, um, they're called Pratekya Buddhas. They're solitary enlightened ones. They actually, def by definition, Pratekya Buddhas understand dependent origination, but they just sort of sit in their cave realizing dependent origination. <laughs> so they're not, they're not following, they're not followers. So they're not Shravakas but they also are not out in the world helping others. So uh, while it's cool to be a solitary enlightened Pratekya Buddha, it's not as kind of helpful to the project as being this Bodhisattva. And so I just wanted you to see that within that first one where they're saying, oh, the Paramitas, yeah, that surpasses the practices of the followers and the solitary Buddhas. They're, it's like, a little poetic riff on the etymological meaning of paramita, where they're bringing in this other idea of surpassing or going over or beyond, right? And then defining paramita as being this kind of unique uh, propi propriety in a way of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. This is not, this is not your parents' Buddhism, right? This is not the early, <laughs> Uh, monastic path. This is the Bodhisattva path, which is, it's, it's different in that way. Okay, I don't plan to do all 30 of these. I just wanted to kind of lay out uh, the groundwork here. And then I have a few that I want to talk about in depth. But before I do, questions or comments, or ideas about anything that's happened just yet? Are you feeling okay? Yeah, just kind of chilling, talking about paramita, <laughs> that's right. Cool, so um, let's go on then. 
Um, I'm going, again, I'm not going to do each one of these. I'm going to actually, the second one is this idea that what does paramita mean? Oh, it means the broad and great, holy, complete Tathagata knowledge. And that's the sort of the, the essence of the last column here was about this almost omniscience. So knowledge is, again, knowledge doesn't really even begin to touch this idea of jnana or this kind of omniscience. But number three is where we really get into some serious bodhisattva territory. Number three, what does paramita mean? Oh, it means to neither let go of or to grasp the conditioned or the unconditioned. That'll probably do us for tonight. Let's start with, with just that one, right? So paramita, the bodhisattva practice, the, the idea here is, is that the bodhisattva neither releases nor clings to the conditioned or the unconditioned. Conditioned dharmas, unconditioned dharmas. Let's begin. So we have a, we have a, a fourfold thing going on here. We can be uh, releasing conditioned dharmas or releasing unconditioned dharmas, and we can be clinging to conditioned dharmas or clinging to unconditioned dharmas. Releasing, letting go, that's the original Buddhist idea is that we're all like this clinging, grasping. That was the problem, is upadana, clinging, grasping. And so the answer for, for your parents' Buddhism, the answer for early Buddhism was release, let go. Conditioned dharmas, let go. That was, that, was the, that was the answer. Clinging, of course, that was the problem. Right, so letting go, grasping, those are our two kind of modes in that way. And again, from, for early Buddhism, letting go was considered good. Grasping, that. So those are that, and now we have these conditioned dharmas and unconditioned dharmas, right? Well, conditioned dharmas are, that's anything. Anything you could possibly think of, uh, a, a clock, cell phone, computer, person, uh, you name it, really. Basically anything you could think of is a dharma, is a phenomena, and a thing. But in particular, it's a conditioned dharma. It's conditional. In the, in the way that this, this being is conditional. And if something were to change and like I were to cut off my arm, like Hui Ke, right? Then those would be the new, that would be the new condition for Michael. So everything's conditional based on conditions. And basically that's everything. And we can let go of phenomenal stuff or we can cling to phenomenal stuff or conditioned dharmas in that way. Then there's the unconditioned dharmas, the asamskrita dharma. The classic asamskrita dharma, the classic unconditioned dharma is nirvana. Nirvana, it, uh, release, is considered an unconditioned dharma. It is not conditional, it is not dependent upon anything. It is not conditional in any way, shape, or form. Um, if, if you're a little confused, you, if you're a little confused right now, because maybe you don't really fully understand what nirvana is, and now these words like unconditioned dharma have really like complicated it even more. The idea of an un, something unconditioned there, the idea of it is, is that it, you know, um, you know, you think something like um, tall. Well, tall 
for somebody to be tall, you, you have to have short. And if there is just one person, they kind of can't be tall because there's nothing relative we're going to be tall next to in that way, right? So to be tall is conditional. It's dependent upon short. To, to be male is conditional. It's dependent upon the feminine. To be this is dependent upon that. To be this is dependent on that. To be here is dependent on there. Here and there are locked into it. So all of these dharmas are conditional. But then there's this idea of an unconditioned dharma. And it's kind of really hard to conceive of an unconditioned dharma because you don't have a lot to go on. <laughs> That's the idea. It's, it has, it's, it's sort of, for, it's certainly formless. It has no form, no shape, no color, no size, no number. But it's also sort of like any an unconditioned dharma. Just it it, it has no no nothing like it doesn't work that way. Like where it's conditional, and again, that's why nirvana is this kind of really considered this really special state or this really you know interesting thing because it's unconditioned. Whereas we spend all of our lives in the conditional in that way. And of course, early Buddhism was all about letting go of, relinquishing attachment to conditioned dharmas and ultimately coming to the unconditioned. Nirvana, that was, that was it, that was the goal. But what paramita means and what the bodhisattva is involved in is neither releasing nor clinging to both conditioned and unconditioned dharmas. Now, in terms of stuff, conditioned dharmas, in terms of regular stuff, the bodhisattva neither lets go of nor clings to conditioned dharmas. That right there is interesting. We, we haven't even gotten to unconditioned dharmas yet. But just that idea that the bodhisattva is in this position to neither let go of nor cling to conditioned dharmas. So insofar as the bodhisattva is not clinging to conditioned dharmas, that's, that's Buddhism. That's the, that's the original idea of Buddhism, was to not cling to stuff, especially conditional things. So that's the original one. So the, the, the bodhisattva is clearly, <laughs> squarely within the Dharma practice in terms of they do not cling to conditioned dharmas. But then there's this other thing, though. But they don't release conditioned dharmas either. And that's where it gets very interesting. That's where the bodhisattva practice becomes the bodhisattva practice, where they are in this place of neither nor, neither clinging to nor releasing. The shravakas, the early Buddhist followers, they were clinging and they were in the business of letting go. Bodhisattva neither clings nor releases in that way. And I, I know I already can feel it. I can feel that there's all the, the bodhisattvas in the room that you know, you already know, you know why that is. You're already there, you're on the pulse of emptiness, and you know, you know about these conditioned dharmas. You've read the Vajra Sutra, and you know that all conditioned dharmas are like a dream, like an illusion, like a bubble, like a shadow, right? They're, they're, they're tricks and games. They're like figments of your imagination, like dream figures. That's the, the phenomenal world, the conditional world, conditioned dharmas. They're dreams, they're fantasies. They are actually not real, substantial in any way, shape or form. There is nothing to cling to or let go of. There's nothing to cling to or let go of. Bodhisattvas, they do not cling to or release, attach anything. They're not conditioned dharmas. <laughs> so that's, the, that's where this emptiness idea, where the pranya emptiness comes in, is in this one. Does somebody, somebody have a question? We got an idea? 
Well, I was thinking, um, so let's say you would say that something is in harmony. Everything in the background appears to be like in a in a group of of a harmony way. Would that be like what you're we're talking about here? Mm. Um, I mean, I certainly wouldn't argue that this puts one in a harmonious place or state, but there's a little something. A uh, more subtle, I would say, going on here regarding this sort of, um, well, it's this interesting movement. And I'm, I kind of keep doing this thing where I'm comparing um, older Buddhist practice to, well, this, the Bodhisattva practice. And while that original Buddhist practice of not clinging is key, it's key this next, this bodhisattva practice of neither letting go nor clinging, it's very, very interesting. And again, I, I think, uh, Michelle, I think, yeah, I think it puts one in harmony in, in a certain way, but I think that word might not be right what we're looking for right now. In, okay. Yeah. It's, it's sort of, uh, actually, Michelle, let me, let me put it to you this way or let me just rephrase what I said, you know, this old Buddhist practice from like 500 BC, that is, it's very renunciatory, right? It's a monastic path. If you're, if whether you're female or male, you shave your head, you wear robes, it's very renunciatory. And the basic idea of that original old school practice was that the things of this world were fleeting, decaying, impermanent, as the Buddha says. And so they're really, they're not really worth holding on to in a certain way. And in fact, the real lesson of the, the, the Buddha's first teaching is that our attachment or clinging to the things of this world is actually causing us suffering. We don't recognize it fully, that that's what's happening, but that's the original one of the original teachings of the Buddha is that it's our clinging that is causing the suffering, and so the original uh, prescription, the the original advice was to renounce, to let it all go, quite literally, and so it's like uh, um, a mortgage got you down. <laughs> you let go of the house, right? Car payments got you down, let go of the car. Um, the, uh, you know, the whole thing, whatever it is, let it go, join the monastery. And so the original practice was about the actual, like, um, like uh, I need better props, right? But, or like, you know, my, my precious cell phone, right? And it's like, oh, oh, I love, you know, I love it. And then the Buddha's like, you know, your attachment to your device and your devices is really causing you. I know you think you like it, but it's actually causing you to lose sleep and all that. And so it's kind of like, okay, mm -hmm. Buddha, I'll, re I'll, let, I'll let it go. And I'm not going to have a cell phone anymore. And I'm not going to have a house. And I'm not going to have a car. I'm not going to have anything. That was the original prescription for, for Buddhism. And just to address sort of Michelle's comment or question regarding this idea of harmony, the idea would be that doing that would put one in better harmony with themselves, with their environment in that way, and that the clinging or the grasping to the things of the world is creating a disharmony. Totally. That's, that's it, the idea of that original Buddhism. But here's the thing, Michelle, and here's the thing, everybody. That original form of Buddhism, as psychological, as psychologically oriented as it was, there is still a way in which they consider this the problem, the conditioned Dharma. And, and you know, I'm talking about my cell phone, but they, of course, were talking about sex, sexuality. They were talking about greed, um, the accumulation of vast amounts of wealth. They were talking about things like that. And then they were saying, yeah, the wealth, the sex, 
the, the devices, all of that is, is bad in a certain way. So let it go, walk away, join the monastery. The type of Buddhism that we're talking about now, here tonight, this Mahayana as it's called, the Bodhisattva practice, recognizes that this is not the problem. My genitals are not the problem. My house is not the problem. My car is not the problem. Those are not the problem. The problem is entirely a, the mental hangup, the mentalness, the mental attachment that can come in the form of senses of ownership, entitlement, all kinds of things. It's more of the mental. And so the idea for the Bodhisattva practice is that I could have, I, I could have this, but if my mind is clear in terms of I'm using it, it's not mine, it's just I'm using it. And so my sense of it's, my disposition towards it is different. That's the path to freedom, relinquishing it in my mind while still having it in my hand. Holy moly, right? <laughs> but that's the idea that the Bodhisattva is more about like, oh, then I really, I really should work on this. And that way, this is not a problem in that, in that way. So it identifies it. And so the first thing that happens in this is a recognition that the bad things are not out there. The bad thing is a sort of mental disposition in that sense of clinging. So that's the first thing that happens. And so if we recognize that, if we're excited about that, right? I hope you're excited about that idea that, that you don't have to go live in a cave. You don't have to shave your head. You could just actually not be as attached to your hair and sense of beauty or whatever in that way, right? So if you're excited about that idea of like, oh, it's not letting it go literally, it's letting go of my mind. That's when we get to this really interesting idea about emptiness. And tonight's not the night because we've done it in nights past and many, many Sunday nights before. Tonight's not the night to do a deep dive into emptiness. But I know that many of you are already aware of that, that what that means for things to be empty. And so that idea of realizing that, oh, wow, it's not even that there was something out there for me to mentally let go of. It was a concept in my mind to begin with. <laughs> I was the culprit all along. And so the idea is, is that through this understanding of emptiness, one, again, and I said it before, one realizes that there is nothing to attached to or release. That is a very freed state of being and a freed state of mind when one realizes there's nothing there to be attached to or release. The other thing though, that the Bodhisattva also neither releases or clings to the unconditioned dharmas. So that's where for many in the, in the audience, I know that the idea of Advaita, like Advaita Vedanta or non-dual uh, Veda philosophy comes up a lot. Oh, non-duality. But, you know, Buddhism almost in a way goes beyond non-duality in that sense, where like they basically like recognize that positing the idea of, of, of non-dual and dual, <laughs> <laughs> so they're like, gotcha. <laughs> and so this idea that the Bodhisattva neither releases nor clings to conditioned and unconditioned dharmas. If the unconditioned stands for non-duality, if the unconditioned stands for nirvana, the Bodhisattva isn't like, oh yeah, the unconditioned. Screw the conditioned. I, it's, it's truly an actual real I can't say it. I can't even say it's a real non-duality because I would fall into the pit, right? But the idea is, is though, is that what I'm hoping you can see and feel just from this excursion is that there is still 
it's still dharma it's still buddhism it's still the four noble truths it's still about attachment and release in that way but the bodhisattva being in this place where they're like neither releasing nor attaching to the real or the unreal the condition the unconditioned it's a that's a unique special place that is that's part of the practice to sort of um to be in that place to be in that place <laughs> uh yeah jason i see it you got th- is that real hey so um i came across this uh i came across in this book this passage where it says that the only thing that the buddha does is notice the flight of the spark of intention between subject and object. And that's like all that Buddha does is <laughs> observe the flight of the spark of intention between subject and object. And so that's like kind of how I understand non-duality. And it's like the it's like the Zen Kuan where the guy says, you know, does the dog have Buddha nature? And it's like the 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 other monk the other monk says moo he says moo which like it does not have food in nature it's like moo and so i was just wondering what your thoughts were on that oh um i i think the, the the yeah um yeah yeah i have a few philosophical issues with the flight of the spark of the thing uh, between subject and object. Um, it sounds nice. I'm not a fully sure it, it, it holds water, <laughs> dharmically speaking. Um, interesting though, I think it's certainly there are, are, are um, things in the sutra a little bit later on that address that more directly, which is the subject object relationship. Yeah, the only reason, I mean, I, I could say a lot more. The reason why I would, I would, um, mm, I would be a little critical about that is just because of any notions of subject and object at all are, are, are off the mark, off the mark from the beginning in a way. And so even if it's the flight of a spark, it, it's like not, a, I, again, it, I think it sounds good, but I think even the, the message of that is not, at least it's not matching up with tonight. Let's put it that way. So I'm matching up with the message tonight. And as far as the dog, not dogs having Buddha nature, that is definitely in, in line with what we're talking about right now. And of course, um, if um, there's a lot of interpretations of what the, the wu or the mu, what that means, um, there's, it's, you know, a lot of uh, interpreters definitely th- it's, it's not saying that it doesn't, that it doesn't have a Buddha nature. That is definitely not the, what the koan is saying in terms of like, do dogs have the Buddha nature? No, they do not. <laughs> that, is, that is not the message. As far as I understand that particular koan, and I do, again, think it relates directly to this one. When the Zen master is asked, oh, but what about dogs? Do they have the Buddha nature? When the answer is mu, it is this grand assertion of the emptiness of dogs, <laughs> the dog, Buddha nature, you, me, everything. And so it's sort of more like, do dogs have Buddha nature? Empty. Right, That's the right. em- emptiness. Emptiness. Yeah. So it's like, it's like when he asked, does the dog have Buddha nature? And he says, moo, what, what he's saying is empty. So it's like, it's like humans can have in nature but for the dog like it, it it's like the quality of food in nature it's like it's like it's like a dog and food in nature. it's it's like having like apples and oranges you know what I mean? it's like it's like dogs don't really pursue food in nature you know what I mean so they don't have food in nature but it's not like a dog's place to have the Buddha nature, so that doesn't exist. So it's like it's like not that the dogs don't have Buddha nature, but that also the dog 
like doesn't have like you know, it doesn't fit with the dog you know what I mean like it's not it's it's like absence it's like absent for the dog like like in like you know, like like it's like if you're qualifying a dog and you're saying you're pointing to this dog and you're saying does this dog have food in nature and does this dog have food in nature it's like for dogs food in nature is like empty you know what I mean it's like it's like it's like both it's like a it's like a paradox indeed and and we could get into some like super quadruple negatives soon <laughs> um yeah um i'm gonna let that one rest is that okay jason yeah good moo discussion good. okay let's everybody okay with the uh, either the the moo koan or neither neither releasing nor clinging to conditioned and unconditioned dharmas right um let's see uh number four is an interesting one uh it's basically this idea of completely understanding thusly which is always a tricky buddhist thing where they are um, bringing in this idea of thusness but to completely understand thusly the error of samsara but actually you should know that it's not the error of samsara it's that in chinese especially chinese buddhism they use a combination of birth death and so actually what this says is it's about knowing the error of birth and death and yes that's kind of buddhist code for the cycle of birth death and rebirth it is, and that's samsara. And so it is totally right and correct says, to say that the bodhisattva completely understands thusly the error of samsara. But I kind of wanted to dwell more on the more literal idea of the error of birth and death, right? That, that idea right there, so the bodhisattva completely understands the error of birth and death or completely understands the error of samsara. And this is speaking, if you're familiar with the general idea of maybe the 12 link chain of causation or just the cycle of birth, death and rebirth as the Buddha speaks about it, you know that the one of the main um, if, if not the main um, contributors to being trapped in the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, one of the main contributors, if not the main contributor, is ignorance. Ignorance. And that's sort of what is being referred to here about this idea of completely understanding the error of samsara completely understanding the ignorance that's involved in the creation of the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, or the, the error that's involved in the creation of samsara. And, you know, I mean, any, this is any one of these all night. We could have done a whole hour and a half Dharma doors on any one of these easily. I, trust me, I thought about it. I didn't really, I wasn't ready to be here for another 30 weeks just on this list. So I am, you know, just choosing a few of these and wanting to go through them. But this one, you know, the Bodhisattva completely understands the ignorance involved in birth and death. That, you know, is such an interesting idea. It's, um, you know, if, if anybody is familiar with this uh, concept, which comes about a little bit later on in this list, which is the tolerance for the birthlessness of all dharmas or the, the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all phenomena. It's, this is kind of a complement to that in that way. So this is about seeing things and not just seeing you and me and sentient beings as being born and dying but this is also but you know within sort of a deeper idea of birth and death we speak in buddhism about production and destruction 
So creation and destruction, birth, death, uh, origination and cessation is another way the Buddhists talk about it. And it really depends on whether you're talking about a sentient creature, which would be born, live, and then die, or an inanimate object that would be produced, exist, and then be destroyed in that way, or again, originate, exist, and then cease. So that's the, that's the view. And this is, the, this is like how we see things. <laughs> we see them as not existing, and then somehow coming into existence, either through a manufacturing process, a production process, or a birthing process. So coming into existence, and then things being, and then things going out of existence. And again, that goes for stuff, it goes for people. And then a big, big one that we sometimes dwell on is our own birth, existence, and demise in that way. The Bodhisattva, however, completely understands the error of that way of seeing things, the error of seeing things as being produced, existing, and then being destroyed. Yeah. And, and of course, yeah. In, uh, Michael, um, I was waiting. Um, is this understood in a way that Michael per se, so, um, um, so, so the Bodhisattva says there is no birthing and no, de no death, right? Is it correct? Did I hear you correctly? Because there is no solid Michael that is ever existent, right? Like, because Michael is every second Michael is different, just on a also physical level. I mean, your cells are changing every second or not is this quite. correct like um right right until, just right until the end right until the yeah. end you right at the end you you went back to what would be called abhidharma early buddhist thinking philosophy and the early buddhist philosophy mm. was about how um it, it was about oh michael okay yeah which part which 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 part and when like me right now, or okay, if I pull out this hair, this version of me. And so the original Buddhist idea was about how if you were to really go looking for Connie or really go looking for Michael, you would actually be very hard pressed to find her or him. Mm -hmm. In terms of like actually putting your finger on on that which is indispensably Connie or that which is indispensably Michael in that way. I spoke earlier about doing a hui ke, right? Bodhidharma's disciple who cut off his arm. So the idea of like, oh, I cut off my arm. So that's not essentially Michael. Okay, how about this arm? How about that leg? How about that leg? At what point do you get to the essential Michael? Or at what point do you just recognize that Michael is a label for this configuration here, but there's not actually a Michael there? That's the early, early version. This is a little, it's related. It's totally related, but this has a little more to do with, again, that emptiness idea, not impermanence. Yeah. So, so for, is this present idea, um, can you repeat the present idea? The present idea. You want me to repeat myself? I yeah, can't. When you say. Uh, What's that? Anyhow, don't, 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 don't worry. Go, go on, go on. I'm, uh, I will figure it out. I have a bad uh, Wi Fi reception here. Go on. Okay. So the. The, the, idea, the idea here is, um, well, you know, the, my example, my famous classic example is this, right? What, what would be otherwise known as the fist. And here's the, here's, this is an example of the um, non-birth, non-death, or non-creation, non-destruction of a phenomena. So here's a phenomena and definitely a conditional phenomena. So a conditional phenomena called 
the fist. And the idea of this, this example is that I can blow the, I can blow the fist away. And so the idea here is, or I can do this one too, which is, oh, look, there's the fist. And then I can put it in here and then, ta-da, where's the fist? Is it in, is it in there? Is the fist in my little pocket? Where'd the fist go? And the idea is, is that if you are looking for where the fist went, or if you're looking for the particles, because it, it broke up and it got destroyed and you're looking for the particles, you're missing the nature of the fist, which is the fist is a label, a name or a word that you have in your mind for a particular configuration, particular shape, formation. And your mind can project that label onto that formation and then behold said formation. But what happens is, is that we're doing this all the time actually with every conceivable object. It's actually a concept in our mind, but that we mistake it for something out there that's very real in that way. And the reason why this fist is an interesting example is that where did it come from? Where did it come from? Right? Where did it go? So if you're thinking about where it came from and where it went, you're thinking about it like a thing, right? And that's not the right way to think about a fist. A fist is not like that. It doesn't come from anywhere except for maybe your mind. If you were sitting there thinking, but Michael, it's coming from my mind. It's like, yes, that's what the Bodhisattva is saying. We know that. But the idea is it's, it's, it's didn't come from anywhere and doesn't go anywhere. And that's the birthlessness of the fist or the non-origination of the fist. It didn't originate. It doesn't come and go, it just be, <laughs> it just be. This is in Buddhism what they call thusness, suchness. It's such, it is. And this is where there can be a fist, uh, phenomenologically speaking, meaning that you can think you're seeing one and I can shake it around and talk about it and we can have a conversation about it. But it's, it's when we go looking under the hood, so to speak, for the real nature of it, and we go looking out here, right? So is everybody okay with the fist being neither born nor destroyed? So the, the reason why I love this fist example is it lends itself so easily to this great Buddhist example. If you're familiar with the idea of the five aggregates or the five skandhas, you can think of this big fat thumb as the skandha of rupa, of form. And you can think of sensations and perception and conditioning and consciousness. You can think of these five aggregates coming together and making Michael or making Connie and Noam and everybody. So the idea of Michael as a label for a figure, a form, is like fist. And guess what? Michael has arrived, thusly, behold. But Michael that you behold thusly is like this. And what that means is, from a Buddhist point of view that's very interesting, is that when the five aggregates, the idea is, is that Michael doesn't go anywhere. Michael didn't come from anywhere. Michael is the label for the thusly beheld configuration in that way. And this is interesting, like, I guess philosophically, right? I keep talking about phenomenology, this idea. And it's, that's all very interesting. But where this really gets important is it's about 
Well, it's about if you if you really are touching this idea of thusness that I've brought up a few times, this idea of like, there's this present time experience you're having. It's called like, you know, the eternal now, right? Eckhart Tolle's book or something, right? Or whoever, uh, Ram Dass, somebody, the eternal now. And this idea of this thus experience in which there's language and labels and names and all kinds of stuff. And one of those labels is this Michael idea concept thing, right? Now, here's the thing is like, just like the fist, it's there, but one can be led astray if you think about it wrong. Meaning that if you're, if, if I do that and you're like, oh, 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 where'd it go? Where'd it go? Then it's like, that's the ignorance. That's where you, you're, you're like, you didn't get it. it. It's not a real thing like that. Well, the idea here is, is that this is not a real thing like that either, but I think it is. I think it is. You probably think it is. And there's something that comes with that, that thinking that way. There's something that comes with that thinking that way, which is if I'm clinging in that sense to self and, and not, you know, clinging in some sort of like ravenous way. It, it's only just like clinging to it, like in some way that it's real, right? So I'm not talking about narcissism or, or inflated ego or anything like that. I'm just talking about literally sort of identifying as Michael in a fixed way. The thing that comes with that idea is that I came from somewhere. In particular, it, I came from a, a while ago when I was born. That's something that comes with this idea of Michael. For me, Michael, for me, Michael, you, you can do this on your own. But for me, Michael, the conceptualization of the, the fixed Michael, the real Michael, what comes with that is the sense of having been born 46 years ago in a particular place to a particular group, to people, da, da, da. But that's that idea of that, the birth, that birthed this. Now, if we were doing old school Abhidharma Buddhism, the kind of idea that Connie mentioned, we would say, really? This, this was born 46 years ago. And it would be like, well, no, 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 not, not like, not this right? Not this skin. This skin didn't come out of my mother's womb. A body six feet tall didn't come out of my mother's womb. But you know, you know what I mean. And it's like, no, I don't know what you mean. What exactly was born that is here now? That's the, that, and that's just old school Buddhism that's asking that crazy question of what, what was born that is here now? And the idea is, is if all you can do is put together a series of events that led to now, but you can't actually touch on the molecule that was there then, that's when you're kind of in that original Buddhism of recognizing like, oh, Michael's a label for an ever-changing thing. But the new Buddhism, the Bodhisattva Buddhism, is even kind of that one step beyond that of looking at this very concept of Michael and then putting that, not the body anymore, but the, what, am I, what do I actually mean when I say Michael? And am I actually referring to this body? And the idea here is, is that when I recognize that Michael is like a fist, is like anything else in that way, if I really recognize that it's I, my nature is like the fist, conditional, in that sense, one thing can happen, which is I can start to realize that the that birthing event or whatever, nothing, not only nothing to do with this, but nothing to do with Michael. Michael is this social convention of people that know me or whatever. It has nothing to do with, with a birthing process. So one of the things that starts to happen with this looking at the self in terms of emptiness in this way, 
one of the things that starts to happen is like, oh, wow, like not, you know, the birthing event, but even past events are, I, I can let them go in that sense. They're not me in that way. And then the really important one can, can begin to arise. If one can then separate, and, and, and I don't mean to do this like ignorantly, we do this out of wisdom, but we recognize that this was, this is, was not born. This was not born <laughs> in that way. And when you really tap into the birthlessness of phenomena, including yourself, there's this wonderful other side of that, which is the deathless. And indeed, Buddhism is even sometimes called a teaching on the state of the deathless. And, and I often like to say deathless does not mean immortal. Immortal means living forever. This is beyond birth and death. It is beyond the concepts of birth and death. And it's uh, what I basically what I want to get at is, is the, the liberative and liberating quality of this teaching of the birthlessness of phenomena or this idea of completely understanding the error of birth and death. Questions, comments, ideas? Michael, is that yeah, no. essentially equivalent to understanding emptiness? Or is that equivalent to understanding emptiness? Or, or are they two separate things? Like, can you understand? About, you mean the birthlessness? Hmm? You mean the birthlessness and deathless aspects? Mm -hmm. I think there's probably a few more aspects to emptiness of which things because of this idea of the empty nature of phenomena, they are birthless, they are deathless, but there's a few other things too <laughs> that are important. It's right? a subset, not a, an equivalent. Um, yeah, in that way. Because like, for example, the one of the ones that I've been kind of leaning on tonight has been more about the, if things are empty in that way, they are desireless. They're not to be desired in the way that we think. And so desirelessness is a very important aspect of emptiness that doesn't really have to do with birth and death in that way. So, but great question though. How does everybody feel about this? Well, I, I have a follow-up. So oh, great, of, perfect. In, I don't know, in, in practical terms, I, I guess I'm not gonna ask you like, well, which one should I work on understanding first? But there is like a way in which you, you, I don't know, you either understand them all or you don't, or maybe you get glimpses of one and it helps you understand the whole thing. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of wondering out loud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, one of the things I'll, I'll say, Noam, just to, to try to kind of wind this down a little bit and tie it all together a little bit is, you know, I've, I set this up a little bit from the beginning, and it has to do with the, the, first, um, the first one of these that we talked about, where it was sort of talking about the followers and the solitary enlightened people and saying, you know, the Bodhisattva path is kind of superior to those paths in that way. And I, the idea here is, is that it's, it's, it's really practical in a lot of different ways, but one of them is, you know, the, as Buddhism developed and then this Bodhisattva thing started to happen or this Mahayana thing started to happen, they, they, I say this often in, in, on Sunday nights, but you know, they're, they're seemingly looking at this other way of being Buddhist and critiquing it. And like I mentioned, they're critiquing it for being followers or something like that. But there's also this critique of, you know, basically being very dualistic when it comes to nirvana and samsara. So samsara is this world that we live in, the realm of suffering and birth and death and all of that. And nirvana, oh, oh, nirvana. And so the idea was is that, and, and you know, I'm not, 
I'm not putting Nirvana down. That's not what this is about. It's not the idea. The idea is that within the tradition of Buddhism, they started to get very like, ooh, Nirvana, bad samsara. <laughs> and that kind of polarity and, you know, more dangerous actually, far more dangerous than the, the samsara Nirvana polarity. The major problem with that renunciatory early Buddhism is that they were so um, basically obsessed with sex and obviously they're not obsessed with having sex, but they're obsessed with like the problem of sex, the problem of sexual desire, the problem of, 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 of desire of which sex is like the worst. And, you know, there's, there's a very strong arguments to be made for <laughs> sexual energy being problematic and all that. Yeah, there's, there's arguments to be made. But something that happened within Buddhism is that, and this happens in religions, a lot of them, which is sex is deemed bad and therefore women are probably, you know, probably right up there with them. It's right there. You're right up there with the bad. And it's like, wait, time out. How did, wait, how did that, how did that association happen? Well, it happened and it's sad that it happened. And so what happens in early Buddhism is that it becomes a two tiered system where the male practitioners are considered above the female practitioners because the females are closer to the temptation or whatever or whatever, I don't know, the mentality here is really uh, bonkers. But fortunately, <laughs> Buddhism recognized the error of its own ways. And so this new tradition split off, which is this Mahayana Bodhisattva tradition, which is deeply vocally egalitarian in a very heavy way. In fact, this sutra in the next part where we get to, it's so explicit about whether it even says whether it's a male or a female practitioner, da, 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 da. it's like very unequivocal about how this is not about male or female in that way. But the reason why a sutra like this is so clear about that is because in other sutras, it, it was clear that it wasn't equal that way. So I just want to like, be, it's just say that the, this stems from, you know, these historical changes where Buddhism turned into like a, a religion, like an institution with all the hierarchical problems of that. But even more, you know, forget the culture and the, the patriarchy, please, like, please, let's forget the patriarchy for a second and talk, it's about this, um, the uniqueness of this bodhisattva path, which is like neither releasing nor clinging to. Um, one that comes up later on, and at this point, I am glad that I read the whole list at the beginning, but this idea of, um, which one is it? About to abide neither in samsara nor nirvana. That's the classic definition of a bodhisattva and a beautiful definition of paramita, which is this idea is that, oh, it means to neither escape samsara nor to rest in nirvana. And so what I'm kind of getting at, or I've been kind of dancing around this idea, but I would kind of want to just try to state it. I hope that you can see, at least the way I've portrayed it, that that early Buddhist movement that was about like, oh, got to let go of this, shave my head, wear the robes, do this, do that, stay away from the women, must get to nirvana. They're kind of like running all around. <laughs> It's like, gotta get out of here, gotta get over there. Oh my God, it's a woman, gotta get away from her, da 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 da. And so it's a lot of this, whereas the Bodhisattva neither releases nor clings, abides neither in samsara nor nirvana, right? Clearly sees the problem of life and death. It's a very stationary, um, nowhere to come from, nowhere to go kind of a vibe. Right. And if you, you start looking at this bodhisattva, not this bodhisattva, but the bodhisattva sitting there chilling and being like, wow, they got nowhere to come from and nowhere to go. And there's no, there's like emptiness. It's like, oh, wow. 
And then you look at the monk and they look like they're, you know, uh, frenetic just over there going crazy with all of their activities. So <laughs> that was probably a little harsh on the, on the, the Shravakas. They're not running around that crazy, but. So it could be like, everything looks harmonious in the background, like, right. But it's, so it's all conditioned, but then it could not be as right as it looks. And that could be the unconditioned. Does that make more sense? Hmm. Hmm. Like everything looks perfect in the background, but then it's really not like the way that it looks. <laughs> hmm. As in conditioned and unconditioned. I think it's always I, there and always not there. I think I'm picking up what you're putting down. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Jason, you got another one? Oh, yeah. So, um, so you were saying that like you're neither like running from samsara but you're not running towards nirvana. So it just brings to mind to me, like the bardo, you know what I mean? Like the between. And it's like in, in like the, in the Hagakure and the Samurai and like, like, like Zen Buddhism, it's like, it's like, it's like their whole, they com they commit their whole mind, body and soul to their master. So it's like, and, and, and it's like they, they, they meditate on death so that like, you know what I mean? Like being awake, like all of the time, it's like you perceive yourself already as dead. And it's like, it's like, it's like, you know what I mean? I do. Let me give you, let, Jason, let me, rather than the Bardo as that, mm -hmm. as that in between sort of like neither, neither here nor there, there's a very, um, there's a beautiful, I guess it's a simile, the simile. It's a beautiful Buddhist simile for exactly what we're talking about tonight. And the simile is, a, it's a story about someone who's lost in the woods. And it's a moonless night. So, and they're, they have, it's cloudy. They have no stars, no moon, no compass. They don't know north, south, east, or west. Totally lost. The Buddha said, the moment the person no longer cares where they're going, they're no longer lost. Wow, that's deep. It's profoundly deep, and it is a tremendous message about the Bodhisattva's enlightenment, which is actually you, what I, I hope you see in that. When it says the moment the person no longer cares where they're going, they're no longer lost. Just like that. And it's not that anything has changed. They still don't know north, south, east, or west. They still can't see the stars or the moon but they're no longer lost. The idea of being trapped in samsara or being ignorant or being deluded is like being lost. And we're lost because we don't really know north, south, east or west. And so we are frantically trying to improve our situation. We're trying to either get more money, more status, more this, more that, because we're sure home is that way or that way or that way or that way. We're sure prosperity and happiness and joy is one of these directions. And we're convinced that as soon as I can either figure out which way is north, south, east, or west, or where the money is, then I'll be happy. I will no longer be lost as soon as I get to the money or whatever. And this is saying, no, <laughs> it's saying that the moment that you stop striving, stop grasping, stop clinging, the moment you do that, boom, you're no longer lost. And th that's just a rewording of the Four Noble Truths regarding attachment, clinging, and suffering. And particularly the Third Noble Truth, which says 
no clinging, no suffering. So the beautiful thing about the man or woman lost in the woods, the, I, the beautiful thing about that story is this realization that it is all up to you. That's what I meant earlier about self-realization, right? It's not about realizing the self. It's that we realize this ourselves. We all have to come to that moment in the woods where we are like, all right, I, this is over. <laughs> this, this suffering is over. <laughs> all right, that's it. Our Michael, past time. It me. <laughs> What's that, Connie? Yeah, it reminds me, just one thing, it reminds me um, a bit of, I think that's what, Buddha said, I can't remember, did it say Buddha or my teacher, <laughs> which is the same, but it's basically, he said, um, the only difference between you and me is that I, that I see you already as Buddhas, you know, in a sense of like the only confusion that we have, that we think there is something that needs to become a Buddha or be, needs to become enlightened. And um, that's the, conf yeah, exactly. So I think it's very beautiful. Exactly. Exactly. All right. <laughs> All right, folks. Um, I think actually, because there's so many in here, I think we're going to do one more night on these. What does it mean to paramita? Uh, what does it mean to be delivered from suffering in that way? A la the Bodhisattva path. Uh, so come back next week for more uh, Dharma attainment. So. <laughs>